important to understand the technology and to be able to make your correct choices. So, what's an apodized diffractive lens? It's basically, they put on diffractive rings on the lens and there are different steps. There's a different, I'm doing something wrong. Thank you. And we're, we're having different steps, different heights, different distances, and it's these step heights that are very important for the quality of vision that the lens can give and for the amount of foci it can give, bifocal or trifocal. So basically this is how those lenses work. Apodized was a word that did not exist. It's a, len it's a word that Alcon invented to describe these steps, these steps that are of different height and distance from each other. Now, what you get is that the diffraction causes the foci to uh, uh, go out of each other, the distance and the near, and at every pupil difference we get a different insertion of light into the eye. So if you have a small pupil of 1.6, which doesn't exist in nature, right? The division of the light is equal for far and near. The bigger the pupil gets, more light goes to the distance. I explain to my patients, it's logical. Imagine you are driving at night and you will be seeing better near than at far. You will have to put your uh, car at the side of the road. It doesn't work like that. So, and we have the synkinetic reflex. We have the reflex of the eyes going in, pupil meiosis when we're reading. So this is actually logical that when your pupil gets smaller, you get in more light for near, so you can use the near part. The rest goes with neural adaptation. The patient will have to learn how to use the lens. Now, after this, we had a, a, a Dutch company, actually. It's based in Germany, and it's called Oculentis. And their owner, Ben Wonders, he's a very smart optometrist. What he did is he had multifocal contact lenses. And those multifocal contact lenses had an addition underneath, ju just like you have in reading glasses, right? And what he s thought was, if I'll put those into intraocular lenses, I will get a uh, multifocal IOL without the side effects that stem from having the rings on the optic. So yes, you have two refractive distances. It's a refractive lens. And again, with rivalry, patients will see distance and near. However, it's not true that it doesn't have side effects because people can still see the, the edge of the addition. So they will not tell you they see halos, but they will tell you they see a banana. And the banana is the addition, okay? So anyone who's telling you that the multifocal IOL does not give optic side effects, don't believe them. It's not true. It cannot be in nature, okay? Or not yet in any case. Now, and then we were um, given the trifocal IONs. And we are constantly being influenced to, to whomever wants to sell us technology, right? So they give us this folder of the trifocal IOLs, and they tell us it has fewer concentric rings. Uh, this is a bifocal IOL. This is a bifocal IOL. This is a bifocal IOL. Either I can't count or it has twice as much rings, right? Yeah. So we have to be awake. How does a trifocal IOL work? Well, in the top you can see it's a bifocal apodized IOL and what you see is that the rings are further apart and they're of the same or more or less the same height. We get a bifocal IOL. In the trifocal IOL, what they did is they used an aberration. When you have a focal length, there is a secondary focal length to every bifocal IOL, and they started using that one in order to make the intermediate. And the intermediate, they weakened it a little bit, so you have a s one set of rings and the secondary that's in between it. So there's actually really two sets of rings on these lenses. Now, these lenses work quite well, but the intermediate is not entirely up to standard and the near can differ a little bit. So the last trifocal, the second generation that came out, is actually a quadrifocal with four foci in which they took one focus, 
and they put the light into the far away. They diffracted it to that side. And what you see, sorry, is that you have two sets of rings again, one for the near and the intermediate, and they make it look like an ECG. They make it drop down here. This drop makes that the light is diffracted away from the quadrifocal, but it also makes that they have less halos than you would expect with such a lens, okay? So this is the technology that's laced into the lenses. Again, the trifocal IOL, this is the first one that came out. It's a fine vision. And um, I took this slide off the internet of sh it's Shara's Dias slide. And what it uh, shows is that the near is at three and a half diopters in the IOL plane, okay? And the intermediate at 175. But the three and a half edition is very nearby. It's like children read. Adults who are a little bit hypropic don't really like that distance. It's too nearby. So that's why they needed the intermediate. Because if you have a lens that has an intermediate that's about 40, 50 centimeters, they'll be fine. They won't actually need a trifocal IOL, okay? And these are the steps again. Here you can see it laced into the lens, okay? And this is um, the fine vision lens, which has these gratings. And what you he here see here is the lens of the panoptics, the Alcon lens. And again, you can see that the gratings are rounded off to create the trifocality, but to decrease the halos. And this is the slide showing us what you do. You get a quadrifocal IOL, and it has a distance and a 120 centimeters, a 60 centimeters, and a 40 centimeters correction. The 120 is not what we need in our biological lives. So this was diffracted away for the distance. And this was done in order to have it, again, be distant dominant. So 50% of the light dispersion is going to far away and 25 to each of the near foci. And it sounds a little bit funny that 25% of an MTF of a light transmission of 100% would be enough to read an intermediate. But luckily we were built to have a lot of reserves. So this works in, in, in our biology, okay? Now, anyone telling you that multifocal IELs don't have side effects, it's not true. These are uh, pictures uh, from an article showing the, the light dispersion. You can see this is a monofocal IOL. So, and these are different pupil sizes, small pupil, larger pupil. The wider the pupil gets, the more side effects you get from having an IOL. Even a monofocal IOL gives some optic side effects, okay? This is the two and a half Alcon lens. It has more halos and glare than the first one. This is the, um, the Technus lens. You can see it's bifocal, it's diffractive, it gives more side effects. This is the Acrylisa. It's a hydrophilic material and it's a refractive lens. A refractive lens means that the refractive rings are rounded and rounded rings, refractive rings, give more side effects than diffractive. We have a very sharp edge which really diffract the light away which gives less side effects. So here you have the trifocal IOL. Monofocal, bifocal for the intermediate, bifocal, bifocal, trifocal. So yes, the more foci w we have, the more side effects the patient will experience. The question is, how disturbing are those side effects? And that's all has to do with, with how our brain functions. Now, what I did here for you is I compared different uh, lenses that I use. These are my data, not from the literature. And I took different, different lenses. So on the left side, you can see the Restore. And then you can see the Oculentus. I've put in quite some of those. And the Lagoon Multifocal is a hydrophilic IOL that's soon going to come out. And this is from the clinical studies that we've done. Then we have the Panoptics. The Panoptics is a trifocal lens. I don't know if it came out here already. Yes. It's come out in Europe and the Acrylisa trifocal. The materials are different, either hydrophilic or hydrophobic, but you can see that the side effects of halos are in all those lenses. They exist because it cannot be undone the moment you have more than one focus, okay? 
And we can see that the reading or the distance vision, it's logmar. So zero is the best there is. Negative is more than better. And uh, uh, a positive result is a little bit less than 1.0. So you can see that these people have excellent uncorrected and corrected distance visual acuities, but also at 40 centimeters, they really, really read well, except for the oculentis. And there's an explanation for this because the addition, as I showed you, it's a progressive addition. And I think there must be some kind of retinal rivalry and that the focus is not really good because of that. But I cannot prove it. I don't have a lab that can prove it. So this is one of the reasons. And how it works, either it's apodized diffractive or it's non-apodized for the newer lenses, meaning that the steps are at the same distance from one another, only the step heights are different, and you can have a refractive asymmetric lens. Now, the latest issue has become the intermediate function of all these lenses. So when I was putting in the restores in the M+, I wasn't even measuring the computer distance because it, it, it it was a non-issue, I couldn't correct it. So either you put your screen closer up or you put on readers for the computer, so I never measured it. But then the trifocals came out and I did start to measure it. And then what I noticed is that, uh, for example, this is a bifocal IOL, the intermediate at 67 centimeters is, is a 0 0.63 decimal on a reading chart, okay? And then in the panoptics, and in the Acrylisa, this is like uh, uh, 0 0.95, and this is like a 0 0.8. So the Acrylisa at the intermediate functions nearly like a bifocal IOL. And here we have to be very smart and we have to decide what kind of lens do we need for the patient, okay? The lens materials are very different. Basically, we have hydrophobic IOLs and we have hydrophilic IOLs. Depends on how much water there is in the lenses. Now, the hydrophobic IOLs, they are more sturdy. They can't be folded as small as hydrophilic IOLs. So we usually need larger incisions. So we have more astigmatism that we cause. On the other side, they also have glistenings. There is no hydrophobic material that does not have glistenings, however, as of late, there has been a technological improvement of how to get rid of the glistenings. You know what glistenings are? So we have, in the lens, we have polymers, right? Those big molecules, and they intertwine. But where they intertwine, there's, there's a space in between. And depending on how these lenses are made, there's a possibility for calcium or water molecules to come in, and you see them as little points on the lens. Now, if it's very little, the patient is not affected. We can see it at the slit lamp, but the patient has a good Snellen acuity or decimal acuity. If they're very, very bad, then their vision is affected, and then you have to exchange the lens. This is rare, but it happens, okay? Now, the hydrophobic IOLs, more than 100 million have been implanted of those in the past 20 years, so they're very safe. And we're saying that they have a high capsule compatibility but this is a misnomer because all the hydrophobic lenses stick to the capsule. So it disturbs the capsule, it sticks to it, but we like it, so we say it's compatible, okay? And then it has a lower uveal compatibility. The uvea doesn't like the, the, the hydrophobic IOLs very much. You get those uh, large, the, the large cells that go and sit on top of the optic when, when you have it with uveitis, for example, okay? So this is what we can see. The hydrophilic IOLs, they're more flexible, so they can go through smaller incisions. We have less astigmatism that we cause. It's clear material. There are no glistenings on these materials, so they're very, very, very clear. However, in children with uveitis, they may opacify, so we wouldn't use it in children. And I'm saying here, okay, capsule compatibility, because basically I think the compatibility is good, it doesn't stick. The capsule does not react to the lens, it stays where it was. And that's why it's a good compatibility, but because it doesn't stick, ophthalmologists in our language were saying it's not biocompatible, or less than the hydrophobic ones, okay? And it has a very good UVL biocompatibility. Now, as you've seen probably, we have a lot of different lenses in the past five or six years or so. 
We used to have two or three or four companies all making more of the same. Everyone had the same lenses, and all of a sudden the market is swamped with lenses in any form that you want and any kind. And how come? And that's because of this company, for example. There are three companies in the world. This is Benz RD, you have Contamac, and there's another company. They make the ground materials from which intraocular lenses are made. And they sell the software, and they sell the materials, and basically you can sit down behind a computer and decide you want a steering wheel for a lens. Or you can decide that you want a C-loop, or you can decide that you want these kind of loops. Anything goes, okay? So a lot of people have been sitting and deciding, well, maybe if I'll make a steering wheel, I'll get a capsule out of the way and I'll have less PCO, or I'll have more compatibility. And this is a problem because we know that there is a difference between the compatibility of different lenses and the eye. It's the compressibility of the haptics. If you have very loose haptics, the lens will tilt. It will get folded on in the capsule and it will bend out. So we need a good balance between the design and the material. This is really crucial. So I went to look into the materials because everyone was telling me that they had invented the wheel and I cannot imagine that this is true. So the Rainer Flex of Reiner, right? It's made by Contamac. It's not their own material. And size, they're using Benz. Oculenses are using Benz material. Medicontour is an Hungarian uh, company. I don't know exactly what they're using. I couldn't get the information. Physio AOL also decided that they invented their own material, but it's they buy their things from Contamac. So it cannot be so many people inventing the same thing all over again, okay? And this affected the shape and the function. So in the right upper hand corner, you see the oculentis lenses. They used to have the multifocal IOLs with the C-loop design, this design. However, these loops were too, too compressible. So what you got is you have an asymmetric lens, you implant an asymmetric lens into the bag, and then you get capsular contraction, the loops contract, and the lens gets tilted but the lens was already asymmetric, so you get asymmetry on asymmetry. The patients don't like that. So they change the lens and now they have the plate haptics. The plate haptics work very well, but they're very sturdy, so you need a big incision, you need a big rexis, and if you want to exchange this lens, it's like, uh, well, doing a delivery with a shoulder dystocia. It's really difficult to get out, okay? Then, the Tetraflex was invented, the Tetraflex was designed to go backwards and forwards a little bit, like, like pseudo-accommodation. However, in capsular contraction, these haptics, again, were too compressible, and there are several case reports out in the literature where the optic really was pushed into the anterior chamber, or completely out of the bag. This is the Fisio IOL, and it has haptics like this. This was for me a reason not to use it, because I was aware of the haptic compressibility. I wanted to see whether uh, this would be compressible, but in someone else's practice, not in mine. Okay, so this is why I never used it. Then this is to show you the compressibility. This is one of my patients in which I put an oculentis lens, and he had an excellent result after surgery. At one month, he had an uncorrected logmar of minus 0 0.02, that's a 1.0 plus. He was seeing 2020 plus, right? And then he came back after three or four months and his vision had decreased by a line, which was very odd to me because I'm not used to seeing that. But what had happened is that he had a capsular contraction syndrome, and you can see this here. His rexis completely contracted. He got fibrosis under the rexis, and the whole lens was tilted out of the bag. You can see the edge of the lens here. Okay, so I went in for a second surgery. And yes, I injured his iris. I put in a CTR. I enlarged the, the rexis. I straightened out the lens again. And his vision increased back to nearly what it was before. I have a follow-up of seven or eight years on this man. And he's doing well. But... This is fun surgery for me to do. I don't think it's fun to be the patient, okay? It's risky surgery. 
Now, with the plate haptics, again, the plate haptics are a little bit sturdy, I told you. So if your Rex is a little bit on the, on the small side, or if you have an injector that, that's not functioning well, you may have what I call, uh, I call it uh, dolphin's fins. You get the tail to flop down. And if it flops down, you get a zonulolysis. Exactly. I implant from here. So this patient got a zonulolysis here with a trifocal IOL. That's really bad, bad news. So because of the zonulolysis, the lens was a little bit tilted and it was not well centered, so his vision wasn't up to standard. I had to do something. I did not want to explant the lens because it didn't have any vitreous loss. So what I did is I used an ASIA anchor. It's a polypropylene anchor with which I took the rexus and I stretched it out to a transcleral suture and it centered the lens very well. Now again, this is a lot of fun to do as a surgeon, but it's, it's a little bit risky. And it's not so much fun for the patient again, okay? Now, what factors play a role in, in our choosing a lens? I think it's the quality of the lens after we test it. So after I decide that the lens design is, is compatible with what I know about lenses, and I'm really modest, I don't know everything, but I have some experience, based on this I'll go. I need the lens to be easy to use if it's difficult to fold or if, it's, if, if I know that the injector is a problem. I will not want to use it. The material has to be good. So I like hydrophobic materials. I also like hydrophilic materials. I have no problem with the material. The only thing is that I look out for, does the patient have guttata? Is he going to have a Fuchs endothelial dystrophy? I'll go to the hydrophobic lenses because Hydrophilic lenses can opacify after you do a DSEC. Okay, so I try to look ahead. None of us can look in the future, but some things we can plan a little bit. Then the prices of the lenses, of course. You know, some of the prices of the lenses are exorbitant. And we're, we're charging our patients for this. So this really plays a role. And I understand that R&D costs a lot of money, but still, I think a lot of money is being made out of uh, patients and doctors. Then we look at the side effects. So if they have compressible uh, um, haptics, I don't want to use this lens because my results will not be stable. I will not be able to uh, predict my own results with that lens because it's not stable in the bag and that's very important. And also the ease of solving the problems. I don't want to put an anchor in every week. Yes, I do want because I like doing it. but. I don't want it because it's not good for my results, okay? So I look at the materials. And then also the incidence of PCO. In some of the hydrophilic lenses, like the Zeiss lens, it's a, it's a plate haptic lens with no angulation. So the bag is stretched by haptics, but not the posterior capsular bag. You don't get the adhesion, and they have a lot of PCO. So in younger patients, or when I can get away with it, I will try not to put in such a lens. If the patients come specifically, I want that trifocal size IOL, you know, I'm not going to discuss it a lot longer, but I, I do have thoughts about this. Now, in my clinic, and, and, and what we do is we, we combine the academic with the private, and we do a lot of research on outcomes. So in this uh, um, study, we compared the asymmetric IOL with the restore IOL, and we saw basically that the distance and the near were quite well, but that for the reading part, the restore was doing much better than the asymmetric IOL. And this is not a surprise because there was an extra lens tilt. And this really, the asymmetric IOLs need more of a newer adaptation than the diffractive IOLs. Then what we did is we compared two types of, of diffractive IOLs, and the only thing that was different between them was the type of diffractive rings and the materials, which is a bit of a loss because we understood that they function well for near and for f uncorrected and for near, for far and, and distance and everything, they function the same. But in terms of quality of vision, stray light, we got differences. Now, this article is about the Acrylisa trifocal lens, the, the size trifocal, and this is an article by Thomas Cohn, and these are his results. 
I'm going to bring you some defocus curves because we need to know how the lens really functions. And I put in the lines. The, the line underneath is always the 0 0.8 for the, for, for the reading chart, and the upper line is the 1.0. So we can see that in the distance, the trifocal really f functions well. It's above 1.0. And the nearby, you see it doesn't reach up to the 1.0. It's a little bit less. It's a refractive lens, so I'm not surprised because these are the results we really get. And still, this is a lens that's supposed to uh, uh, correct the intermediate. Huh? And the defocus curve is always done with full correction, so there's not a, a, a problem of a refractive residual error here. This is what the lens really gives. So at the minus one, where they should be reading well, they're on the 0 0.8 line. So this is a trifocal IOL. So yes, it gives an intermediate of 0 0.8, but as, as I show, showed you on the, on, the, on the table, also bifocal IOL gives you 0 0.63. And on the reading chart, that's not a big difference, okay? It's a difference in side effects. Then this is the focus of the panoptics curve. Also by Thomas Conan, he went and put his first six eyes out in the, in the journal, 0 0.8 and the 1.0. His first three patients had excellent results. This is really, I've never seen this before. It's really looking very well. But as a scientist, I must say N is six. This is really the very first of this, okay? But it's encouraging. And what I did here is I took the defocus curves that I found in the literature from all these articles and also one of mine. And I summarized them. I, I made a table and I made a new graph. So the green one is the acrylisa. Well, we already saw that the reading is not up to par and the intermediate is OK. Then the fine vision lens. Again, the reading is not good enough. It's not up to 2020 vision. The far away is good in all three lenses. And the panoptics, again, with my own data and Dr. Conan's, Professor Conan's data, is good for the reading and also the intermediate. Well, the intermediate in the other graph was a little bit better than this, but still this is good, okay? These are good results. It's a good resemblance of, of the real defocus curve we have when we don't have presbyopia. This is an older... Um, an older uh, defocus curve comparing bifocal IOLs which have a reading distance of, of 30 centimeters and 40 centimeters. So if you're plus four, of course you will have a bigger dip in your vision. It's inherent to the technology, it can't be different, but nearly no one is using the plus four lenses anymore exactly because of that reason, because of this dip. That's why we went from using the plus four lens to go to the plus three lens so that the near vision will be more in the adult space, using space, and will have less of a dip in the intermediate. So as you can see that our technology really develops with trial and error. We're learning from our own technologies how to improve it, and that's what the industries do too. Here I put on uh, the, the focus curves, but for bifocal IOLs, and again you can see that the distance is quite good in most of them. F somehow the acrylisa is not really performing as well for distance and near. The technis, I don't know what happened here, but it's not up to standard. And we can see that the restore is really doing well, the light blue one, okay? And again, you s can see that the intermediate with the bifocal IOL, if it's a good bifocal IOL, it's not so bad. The difference isn't as big <laughs> as people want to make us believe. Now. I find that comparison of the lenses is very difficult because we don't have standardized parameters. We're using uncorrected, corrected visual acuity. We have to refract the patients. There's no consensus on the near acuity of how to measure it, right? And there's uh, uh, no consensus on how to use the, 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 the near. Are we going to do this monocularly while looking close up is a binocular function? Are we going to, read, do, to do reading tables, which will make it impossible to do research because it's time and time is money and we need to work and we need to earn our living? So it's a real big problem. And also we have no consensus as to quality of vision. And quality of vision is a big, big thing. We use stray light and I'll sh show you shortly what that is. <coughs> and then we have patient satisfaction. In, in Europe, everyone is going crazy about PROMs. You know what PROM is? 
patient reported uh, um, patient reported mm, measurements, post-operative measurements. They get a questionnaire and they have to fill it out how satisfied they are. But imagine a patient who is coming in after he had a row with his wife in the morning. Will he be satisfied with his lenses? I don't think so. Okay, so these are very subjective. And that's why I like stray light and I'll show you in a second how we do that. So the defocus curves are very important because then you can put them on a graph together, but it still doesn't tell you anything about the quality of the vision. What for the intermediate, what we need is we need to know where are we working. And the American uh, Occupational Safety and Health Organization decided that for patient of a average build, 60 centimeters is excellent to be comfortable at a computer. When do you need an intermediate of 80 centimeters? That's when you're a very tall Dutchman, two meters and five tall, okay? The Dutch are the, the, the biggest persons in the world. It's, uh, there's evidence out there. I'm very small there, but it doesn't matter. Most people aren't two meters and five tall, okay? So I went around my own kitchen. Yeah, I have something with my kitchen. And I took a ruler and I started to see what I can do. So when cooking, I don't need more than my arm lengths. I can't, I can't cook farther away than that, right? The dishwasher, I need a little bit more, but that's very easy. I tell the kids to do that, so that works well. Going into the fridge, it's again, it's, it's your arm length, right? Mm -hmm. And then when I want to read the paper, we have tabloids, so this is fine. My arm length is more than enough. I don't need 80 centimeters. And then what I did is I did a defocus curve on the different lenses that I'm using. Now, basically, this is comparing apples and oranges because the lenses are different and there are different types, different materials, but still it works out for me. Again, the line of the 0 0.8 and the 1.0, we see the trifocal panoptics in red and the trifocal size in black. Again, the Zeiss lens is not up to par for the near vision. So if you put in a Zeiss lens for a myope, who is a spoiled nearby person, they will not be as happy with the trifocals. It's, it just can't be done because they're accustomed to good near vision, okay? Now, if you have a bifocal IOL, which is the green one is the restore toric, the blue one is the lagoon, the new one that's coming out soon, we see that the nearby is very good in both lenses, green and blue, and that the intermediate goes down, and it goes down to 0 0.2. But is 0 0.2 such an issue for the intermediate? I'm not so sure, because this is 0 0.63 and this is 0 0.8. Go in your clinics, look at the reading chart, and see what the difference in the size of the print is. Newspaper print is usually up here, so they can do this. Who needs to see those very, very small letters on his computer? Who needs to be able to see every single pore in the person they're talking to at one meter distance? No, really, seriously. We don't use this in our life. We are looking with our brains, right? So we can see whatever we need to see, and we discard the rest because it's too much data. So we should also be a little bit critical of the input that we're getting of how important this distance is, okay? Now, quality of vision. In Amsterdam, there's a man, and he's called Tom van den Berg, and he is an optical physicist. He's one of the smartest per persons in the world, and he decided that he's going to measure optical quality. Now, the eye, when we're looking, some of the light comes onto a focus on the retina, right? But some of the light gets dispersed, and it gets dispersed by the cornea, and by the anterior lens, and by the lens itself, and by the iris, and if you have a blue or brown eye, it depends how much light comes in. And then we have vitreous floaters, they also disperse the light. And then you have something on the retina, it will also disperse. So not all the light that we're seeing is coming onto a focus on the retina. And this we can measure, and we can measure it with this machine. It's produced by Oculus. The patient sits with his correction on, and he has to choose at a flickering light. It's a glare meter, basically. 
Now, this is how Straylight looks. This is Tom van den Berg, he's very serious, and he is showing in his own lab that if you have a little bit of a cataract, your contrast will go down because your lens will have more forward scatter. It will take down the contrast, and that's how you will be looking. But if you go out in the street at night, this is the glare that you'll have from an oncoming headlight, but if you have a little bit of a cataract and your stray light is up, this is what you'll be seeing. After seeing this, my conclusion was that the big painter Van Gogh, he must have had cataracts. <laughs> I'm convinced, right? So, by definition, internationally in the standard, stray light is disability glare, is glare that we can measure, and we can measure it reliably and repeatedly. And the nice thing of this machine is that if the patient wants to get a reimbursed cataract, he thinks they can fool me on the machine, and they can't because it has an internal algorithm. Patients cannot fool you, so that's very important. I Please have a seat. Don't see, right? Yes. Can We're calculation biometric? I'm afraid we had it, but I'm willing to give it again if you want to. <laughs> what are you giving right now? It's multifocal IOLs. No, we switched the program in the morning. Okay, because I'm a moderator, they said at 10 o'clock. I was told in the morning to, to speed it up a little bit because the opening ceremony is going up. It's okay. But, okay. but... Yeah, I'm coming back, thank you. I'll do it again, no problem. <laughs> okay? Then, um, now the, the stray light we measure as log S. And it's a logarithmic scale, and it cre increases with age, mostly because of cataracts. So this is a very good machine. Now, this is uh, a combined uh, research of my colleague, Ivanka, and myself. What she did is she took a large cohort of people with cataracts, and she put them onto the line. And here you can see this is uh, visual acuity in Logmar. This is 2020 here, and here it goes down. And here you see stray light. Stray light in a normal young person would be zero log S 0 0.9, the green line. The older we get, the more stray light we get. And what we see is that together with the vision that's going down, the stray light is going up as you get more cataracts. And those are the, the gray dots. Then what I did is I took some of my refractive lens uh, exchange and California cataracts, early cataract population. I took all the patients who had a vision that was better than 0 0.8 and I put them on the graph. So these are all these black dots here, okay? They really had good vision. The funny thing is that all of them had a stray light that was a little bit increased. So they did come in with a reason. Yes, their visual acuity was good, but no, their quality of vision wasn't good because their stray light was a little bit higher. And then I did surgery on those people. And what we saw that in this group of uh, 160 eyes, we saw that the log S, the stray light, decreased. It be improved. Quality of vision improved. And whomever had more stray light before surgery had the best improvement in stray light. And then, because it's a logarithmic scale, right, one line in the log mar is more or less equal to one line in the, in the stray light. So an improvement of 0 0.09 which was statistically significant, is like an improvement of one line. And these were eyes with good preoperative vis visual acuity. And the funny thing is that in 27.5% of patients, one in four with an improvement of log S of 0 0.2, like a two-line improvement, most in the people with cataracts, but even so in the people with refractive lens exchanges. So even when people come and tell us, please, ta please take out my lens, I don't like my reading glasses, they already have something in their quality of vision. People don't come because there's nothing, okay? So this is very important. Now what we did is we put all those people on a graph. The round, the white round ones are preoperative, the black ones are postoperative, and from this we could extrapolate a pseudo-phakic norm. The black line is the increase of stray light in the normal phakic person, right? The older we get, the more cataract we get, more stray light that we get. But then, if a person is pseudo phakic, we see that we cut out the cataract portion. So people have a stray light that's more normalized, that's more back to normal. It still increases with age because also the cornea and also the vitreous 
contributes to stray light, okay? It can't be completely flat. Now, stray light has been out there for about 30 years and more people have done research on that and there's very different research. For example, Burkhard Dick found that there's no difference between a multifocal IOL and a monofocal IOL. The freeze showed that in multifocal IOLs there's a small increase. Elmer showed that there's more with the multifocal IOLs. Different people showed that there's no difference. Here there's no difference between the types and here there's no difference between the the diffractive and the sectorial addition. But we're still not convinced what happens. What we have shown is all our patients were implanted with multifocal IOLs is that we can see that there is the bigger the stray light is before, the bigger the improvement is. So sometimes it's really worth, even in calculating the decrease in stray light that the multifocal IOL causes, but we will still decrease the stray light, improve it, okay? And this is with two different IOLs. So this is the hydrophobic IOL, and this is the hydrophilic IOL. We're not yet out there knowing exactly what the difference is. Is it only the material or the glistenings or the amount of PCO, or is it also the diffractive pattern on top of the lens? We still, we're on top of it. We're working on it, but it takes a lot of time. Now, for example, this is from my clinic, and we showed that the hydrophobic IOL and the hydrophilic IOL had a difference, and it was statistically significant. Is it clinically significant? Well, 0 0.06, it's like three letters on a chart. I don't know, if people would have age-related macular degeneration, three letters would be a big time issue. In cataract surgery, I'm not sure that this is enough, okay? Then, Talking about cataract and refractive lens exchange and the use of the multifocal IOL, there was a big review recently uh, published by Roseanne et al. And what they showed is that most of the people have a 2020 vision, nearly 80%. And the mean binocular vision was a logmar 0 0.05, which is 2020 minus, right? Near vision, again, there's a wide way of how to measure this. We're not clear, we don't have a standard, and this makes it so difficult, sorry, to, that was not a floater, that was a fly. And uh, this was, this is, we, we don't know how to do this, okay? Yeah. Also, the patients have their own preferred distance. Should we be measuring this? Should we, I have a physiotherapist with a bifocal IOL, the man is two meters five tall, and he's a physiotherapist, so he sits ergonomically. He is complaining about his intermediate. All the measurements are exact, right on. He has good vision, but he doesn't like it because it doesn't l fit into his lifestyle. Okay, so this is, I lost this patient because I didn't get him to get what he wanted. The, the focus curve, in my opinion, but also in the opinion of Rosen, will show how the IOL performs more or less in vivo, corrected for the distance, but still it will not say how the patient perceives this. And we see that, that multifocal IOL give big spectacle independence. I think this is an underestimation because it takes, it's a review of all the data that was out there, it's a meta-analysis, and we have a tendency in refractive surgery to under-report. We like to report results that are not the best of the class because we don't want the benchmark to be the best of the class, okay? We don't want to underperform, so we're under-promising and over-delivering. We do the same thing in the literature, I think, okay? Contrast sensitivity can give different outcomes, and as a rule, it's, it's age-matched and it's normal with multifocal IOLs. I don't like contrast sensitivity as a measure. Why? Because it's not standardized. It's very operator dependent and we can never compare it. And that's why I like stray light. Stray light gives me one number. I don't need to think. I can just put it on a graph and I know where the patient is. Visual symptoms. All our patients ha have visual symptoms. Halos, glare, disabling glare, zero to 10%. I think this really depends from the center because you can manage the patients. And in my experience, if patients do experience these things, usually 
they get used to it. Neuroadaptation, our brain is a wonderful thing. I've had to explant, maybe, not maybe, I know. I explanted two lenses in one patient of mine in my whole career because of halos and glare. And I think that the mistake was mine. The patient had the fibromyalgia. I don't usually do multifocals in fibromyalgia. She was a nice lady. She convinced me, you know, she had a lot of honey. And I, I shouldn't have done that. I wasn't listening to myself. So be close to your own set of standards. It's very important. Then some glare in higher percentages in some of the, of the articles. We know it's there. But we know that most patients can cope. Okay. In the terms of post-operative uh, complications, my brother is an is a, uh, orthopedic surgeon. And well, of course, we talk shop when we're eating together. And then he tells me, you know, you ophthalmic surgeons, you're so spoiled. He says, you know how to predict within a half diopter what you're going to do. He says, I'm doing a leg and I hope that my patient will be able to walk afterwards. He said, it's so predictive what you're doing. You have no idea what's going on in the rest of the medical world. And this is true. This is something that we need to realize, that we are really on top of our numbers. We really... Uh, we really perform well, okay? So post-operative complications are rare, and when they happen, it's really bad news, and most of it we can remedy. CME, retinal detachments, endophthalmitis is saying one in a, one in 10,000, one in 1,000. Yes, it happens. You know, it's part of life, but the patient needs to know and needs to make his own decision if he's willing to take the risk. Crossing a road also means taking a risk, right? Now, patient satisfaction is good. Th it's between 62% and 100% depending on the study. I told you already, patient satisfaction is a very, very difficult uh, uh, issue. It's related to so many things. Once a year in the Dutch newspapers, there is a, a, a survey of how happy, how satisfied with their lives the Dutch people are. And the mean that we get every year is about a seven. And I pity the people who just think life is a seven, you know, I'm, I'm much happier than that. But it's, it's so difficult. But if, if general populations give life a, a number of a seven between zero, it's really bad, and ten is excellent, then we're really doing well, okay? This satisfaction is usually related to blurred vision, to residual refraction, to PCO, to large pupils, to dry eyes, and this is from the article of the Fries. He really made a nice big article about it. Complications. Is PCO a complication? Depends, we can solve it, right? So we don't really think it's a complication. But we, you can have secondary complications, more floaters, retinal detachment, CME. So yes, I think it's still a complication. And we get it time dependently in a significant number of patients. Explantation is rare, depends on your practice. And, well, the last one, you know, I usually say that these are important articles. People who come out there and dare to state the things that are obvious, the things that we've never written down or just said. Yes, patient personality significantly affects perceptions and tolerance of the glare and the halos. Unfortunately, we don't have a preoperative test to check this. And this is literally what I say to the patient. You know, I don't have a test. You have to do some introspection. You have to take responsibility for your own decision. Then, the IOL design also affects how patients uh, do. The presbyopic emetropes, they do well, but they complain more visual side effects because they were spoiled. The only thing that was wrong with them that they needed readers, right? Then the comparison in the multifocal IOLs, it's really difficult. The designs are dif different. The testing is different. It's, it's, it's a real jungle to get all those data in a row and try and see this. I tried for myself in those defocus curves, and I showed you today, but it's difficult to compare. Diffractive IOLs perform better at near. Well, I've shown that in the graphs. That's true. Trifocal IOLs. They smoothen out the defocus curve, but some of them may not perform as well nearby. And you need to take this to, into account when treating myopic patients. 
we have more spectacle independence with the diffractive IOLs, and contrast sensitivity losses are similar with all lenses. Still, the contrast sensitivity is under very specific uh, um, conditions. So anyone who wants to go to a rom romantic restaurant where the, where the menu is in very small letters, yes, they will need readers or a light. If they know this ahead of time, it's not a problem. And if you look in normal life, elderly people, when they go and read, they put on glasses and they put on the light because they lost their contrast from their cataract. So everything is a little bit relative. Five minutes, yes, I'll be there, yeah. Okay, now the approach. We're doing something wrong. Only one to 9% of our patients in Europe are getting premium IOLs, so we're not doing as well as we could. And we know how the lenses perform, we know the side effects, and we know that the, the side effects are well tolerated if we choose one. Our calculations are very good, our predictability is good, and we have solutions for residual refractions. We'll do a laser touch-up. So what's the problem? The problem is very simple. It's us. We don't dare to do this. We don't dare address the, the issues with the patients. Okay? And this is really very important. And there are economic constraints. So this is how I work in the public hospital. First, I see if there's a contraindication. If there's a contraindication, I will not do it. Again, I'll tell the patient I have nice technology, right? I want them to tell their neighbor. If the patient is interested, and uh, I'll go. If he's not interested, it's a no-go. Hmm? Yes, OK. Then, if the, if the patient is financially capable of doing this, I'll go on. Financial hardship, in my opinion, it's a no-go. There are more important issues in life than having freedom from spectacles. We don't give out loans, and we don't have payment plans. Either you can do it, or you just Enjoy your life as it is. Life is good. Okay? Then, in the refractive clinic, people come because they decided they want a multifocal IOL. And usually my problem is when I say no, then my patients are really angry at me. So I'm looking for contraindications and I'm looking to please very high expectations. These are all the lenses. I'll skip it because I was told that we need to move on. But these are all the lenses I'm still using, and I think that except for the uh, radially asymmetric, most lenses are really good. What we do is we have to match, we have to make sure what the patient does. The mistake with the physiotherapist who was more than two meters tall, it will never happen again in my life, okay? When they come in, I just look if they're taller than me or not. Now, I uh, see who sent them. If it's someone who was unhappy but is still sending in, means that they really trust me to do a good job. I see what the patient's wishes are. If patients have unrealistic expectations, I'm not even starting to do this because, you know, I lose too much time on that. Under the age of 52, I'm very slow to go because they're not past myopic yet. They're younger eyes. There are more problems. I'm just... I don't need to do this to earn my living. I do this because I'm academically challenged to do this, okay? And then I look at the patient's behavior during the consultation. If it's a very um, aggressive patient or a patient who knows everything better than me, it's fine, then he needs to find a, a doctor who can address his issues. I can't, so I will not do it, okay? I shy away from younger male myopes under 52 because they are spoiled nearby lookers and you cannot please those. And I really think that the difference in the intermediate between bifocal and trifocal isn't so big, and also the difference in contrast sensitivity is so big, but you need to take it into account. You need to give the patient a choice. We want a little bit more contrast sensitivity. You'll have to put your computer a little bit closer. You'll have to adjust your behavior. If the patient is okay with that, you go ahead, okay? Careful with the amotropic press biops, and you need to manage astigmatism. These are the expectations of our patients, and I hope you will comply with those. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Do you have any questions? So you were saying that the spray light decreased after cataract surgery. Yes. Did it change again if you did like yak capsulotomy? Yes, it, it also decreases after yak capsulotomy. Okay. Yes. You can, if you go to PubMed and you uh, search for stray light, all the literature is there. Everything that's with the name Vandenberg, that's validated and good. 
Okay? Yeah. Any more questions? Thank you for having me.